All right. So let's get into this topic. Um, what I got is what time frame can a student expect to go from white to blue? Um, and I know there's different scenarios with like, are they coming from wrestling? Or are they coming with a blank slate? Are they older? Are they younger? Um, I know with IBJJF, there's right now there's no time limit on white to blue. So just, I guess, I guess from your perspective, What's the earliest you've seen white to blue? And then what's the longest you've seen from white to blue? So I'm assuming you're wanting to have it in like months or years and stuff. Uh, Yeah. Um, Maybe trying to avoid injury time because I know that that kind of throws a different, mm. different caveat into the mix. So mm -hmm. yeah, maybe, maybe months, maybe years. I don't know if you yes. have a time metric or... <laughs> Yeah, so I would say an average student is between a year to year and a half if I had to just put a blanketed time stamp on it. I've had a student finish it. I've had a student do it as a fast as with no grappling experience, no anything about five months to I've had someone take four years. And so, so with, with the five month that you said you had, is is that somebody coming from different background judo or wrestling or no nothing they're only jujitsu they're just super athletic and they were well they so at our academy that we teach and train out of we have basically two main ways that we grade for a blue belt we have a technique proficiency so they have to demonstrate the knowledge so if i say show me this arm lock from the guard i'm checking to make sure that they know the steps and the details of the way that we want it taught so I'm grading them based upon how they actually do the move, if it's right, wrong, whatever. So there's a, a proficiency component of that. That's one. And then the second is is how they are doing in like live training against resistance because it doesn't mean anything if you can't do it against resistance, right? So they – and so in order for someone to test, they have to have four stripes. And in theory, if they've had four stripes, they should have gone through all of the curriculum several times, right? And seen it enough to drill it to a proficient level. So that's kind of one metric. And then they actually have to then test for it. Sure. So this student literally just came like six days a week, did every class, didn't like miss, came five, six days a week, was super disciplined. And then what I think really helped them was as they got to like their third stripe, I guess, if you want to call it that they started working with me and doing privates, like at least once a week or once every other week to kind of get them ready to clean up stuff for their test. So they really just took it seriously. They just, I mean, you could say they probably spent, uh, I mean, a class is an hour, then they would do advanced class sometimes and then do a private. So they would, they're, they were training like 15 hours a week, probably. That's a lot. Yeah, that is a lot. So uh, I'm glad I'm glad you actually touched on that because that that could be end up being a topic for another time. But what I guess whenever you're getting closer to that next belt, maybe continually taking private so that you can clean up those things that you were talking about. I'm I'm glad you because I never thought about that before. But yeah, now that you say that, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. One of the main ways that I encourage students to start taking privates, and this is not like a a pyramid scheme that I'm trying to run here or trying to get more money out of students. But like a lot of times students don't know any value of what they can like get from a private. They, they, they're not sure what they're looking for. They just think that like, wow, this instructor who's standing over me, something good must come out of it. Right. And, and that's not wrong, but I don't really even recommend private lessons to students until they've done at least a couple of months of jujitsu because they don't even know any what they what problems they have yet they, they don't know what they don't know yeah they don't know so like I, if you're coming to class regularly like i just just focus on that and then whenever you start sparring after you know whatever amount of time and you start experiencing problems then that's the best time to come do a private so how i encourage students is if they don't want to do it on a regular basis obviously because there is a financial thing with that is when they get to their third stripe roughly I would say, hey, it's not a bad idea if you want to start doing them or thinking about it. And we allow for a split private. So if someone wanted to grab another white belt or another student and split the cost, 
then that's that's financially very simple to take care of. It's just about time and carving it out there. So now right. you're like making sure that the instructor is like checking everything and spot checking everything. You know, you're not going to learn probably any cool moves, but you're going to make sure what you know is good enough for the blue belt, right? Of what you're trying. That's your goal. So that's right. a lot of times how I get private lesson students on my schedule a lot of times is is that and then obviously you know you get addicted to that one on one attention and they want to continue with that going forward so but i've also had students who only do privates who don't do group classes and they only do privates so that's a little bit different of a strategy i've seen i've seen a little bit of a little bit of those students like just do the privates and i feel like there's there, there's definitely some benefit to that um do you ever do you ever have students like maybe record the techniques that you're going over in privates or allow them to record or? Yeah. Um, as long as they're the ones doing it. So right. I, right. I want them to do the move. So if they want to drill it on me and like they set up their little tripod and, you know, go over in the corner, then that's totally fine. Um, cause it helps, cause it helps coming back to it and you can like see and re Oh, my foot went here. My arm mm -hmm. went here or whatever. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but yeah, pri but you know, the negative part to a student only doing a privates, you know, not doing group classes is they're not training with different bodies. So they're not training with, you know, different resistance levels, different sizes, you know, they're only training with me, which sounds great. You're like, well, you're a black belt, you can do whatever, but it's like, even if they wanted to go as hard as they could, I can shut it down. Like it, it's not the same realistic feel. Like my hundred percent is not the same as someone who is their skill levels a hundred percent. Sure. And there's only so much you can simulate of that. So, yeah. And then, so you talked about, uh, I guess the longest one you were saying. Four years. <laughs> four years. Okay. Yeah. So, so like walk, walk me through that. Is, is there an injury that happened in there or. Yeah. Yeah. Somewhat, but also it was a lack of discipline um, and a lack of willpower. So a lot of, like I said, at our Academy, we have a per, we have a curriculum that students have to learn to become a blue belt. Now, just because you learn the curriculum, that's not the only standard. Once again, you have to demonstrate that you can do it against resistance. So basically in class, like I'm watching you, how you're doing in class and even in the test, whatever you want to call that exam demonstration for their blue belt, there's a rolling component. So I'm seeing that too. So it's not just, oh, here's the moves. There's the belt, right? It's not that simple. Right, right. And, but... The other part is easier for students to do than the demonstration part. Students don't want to do be disciplined and drill the same thing over and over again. And so this student specifically just kept twiddling their thumbs and would go to the advanced classes and not go to basics classes or not just knuckle down for like two or three months and just really focus on that and get it. So their, finally, their, their attendance, I guess, was very sporadic. And, and with, with injuries and, you know, family mm -hmm. stuff that goes on, it, I guess it just naturally took that four years that, but then they would also come for like four months pretty consistently and never do a basics class or never hit up an instructor and say, Hey, I'm really wanting to do this. And they were just, they were fine staying a white belt and just continuing to train. Right. Well, I guess you do kind of run into that, that issue of, do you want the students to come up and say, Hey, I'm ready for this. Or do you kind of just let the professor come to you and say, Hey, I think you're ready for this. Mm -hmm. I'm ready to help you whenever you're ready to go kind of thing. It's a good question. Um, it's usually a little bit of both. So like this specific student that I'm referring to, they were encouraged several times by the instructors to take their test. They just chose to not do it. Because they chose, once again, this is the discipline part and willpower, they chose that they said that wasn't as fun or as high on their priority, and they just didn't really care to do that. Okay. So okay. then I'm going to care about their journey as much as they do. Right. No, that makes sense. Right. Um, have you ever they seen- finally did get it, though. Like I said, they finally did. <laughs> <laughs> Good for them. <laughs> That's a big step. But yeah, uh, I imagine, you know, being white belt for four years, there's, there's some aspect to- there's a good aspect of that where now you're potentially, if, if you've been putting maybe enough work in, but not enough to be a really good blue belt. Now you're a pretty good beginner entry level blue belt, which I don't know if that's the case for them or not, but. Yeah. I mean, they've, they've had a lot of mat time. They've had a lot of rolling time, but like one thing that I, 
we try to encourage at our school is like, I want a student not to know it as well as an instructor necessarily as a blue belt. But like if a white belt student, like we teach a arm lock series from the guard, right? So it's in our basics class, for example, and there's three or four different variations that we teach in that lesson. If a white belt student goes up to a blue belt student in my school and says, Hey, I can't remember this one. Can you show it to me? They should be able to show it to them. If they cannot, that's a problem. <laughs> sure. So that's what I want them to be able to know. So sometimes though, you get students that, you know, will pass and they're good, but they've only really learned the information that way. And they don't know all the details of all the steps and they can just kind of like you did on an exam, like on a test, you just kind of memorized it. Then you just threw it out. Mm -hmm. Right. So I was, just, I was just about to bring that up too. <laughs> Yes and no. So I've seen it go both ways. I've legitimately had students like cram, I guess, if you want to call it that. I think it's harder to cram for this because it's like a physical thing. It's not guessing. Yeah. Like, so there has to be some component. But then it is one of those things, too, that if you don't use it, you lose it. So like if you haven't practiced it or done it like that, then, you know, it goes I, away as well. I can definitely notice whenever I'll take like maybe a couple weeks or a month off and then I come back, I'm like, man, I feel like I've lost some skill and, and mm -hmm. it, it always comes back for sure. And it always, you know, ends up catching up, but I, I definitely notice whenever I'm taking some time off. So uh, diving into another subject about this, have you, have you ever watched any of uh, Roy Dean's like purple belt demo, brown belt demo, black belt demo. And have you ever seen like, I, I don't know if that's kind of how y'all y'all run it because from from my perspective, watching the Roy Dean demonstrations is they'll typically go through their curriculum of what you had you had mentioned of hey do these techniques or do mm -hmm. the techniques of what you want to demonstrate of what you think a blue belt a purple belt or brown belt level is and then at the end of that they end up rolling mm -hmm. but I don't know if you've noticed how they roll and this is where I was going to ask you how your rolling aspect differs they'll typically start them. Like if it's a blue belt demo, they'll start them with another blue belt. And mm -hmm. then after that blue belt, they'll roll them with a purple and then yeah. around. And then it's Roy Dean at the end. It's like, yeah. So kind is of a gauntlet different? style. Yeah. Like, you know? Yeah. So is that how you have people roll or is it typically just during class, you watch them roll and are you watching for people that maybe they're the same weight class or skill level? Or what if, what if these White belts are bigger. Are you watching that too? Like, like walk me through that a little bit. Yeah. So honestly, at it's going to sound kind of like anti a lot of what other things in jujitsu say. Honestly, at blue belt, the skill is important. Like I, I do want students to be able to do it against resisting. But in my opinion, what's more important is that they have a solidified knowledge of that stuff because they can always make it better against skilled people like once again that belt fitting too loose type idea as mm -hmm. long as they understand it then they can continue to roll and spar and train and make it better right, right. so i'm more looking when we do our test a majority of it is the demonstration because we're trying to see all of the techniques right we're trying to see to make sure you know them all and then yes in class i have seen them roll i have seen them spar and then a lot of times I've sparred with them myself, like I was, several times in I was, class. I was just about to ask that too. Yeah. Yeah. In class. So I've kind of watched them already. And then at the end of their um, test or demonstration, whatever you want to call it, they usually will spar with the main instructor that's there. So if it's like myself, they're going to spar with me. If it's my, my instructor who's running the test, they're going to spar with him. So it's only really against that. And we're really just trying to because you're going to be tired at the end. You're going to be mentally exhausted. This means a big deal to you. You're on stage. You're having to pressure test it. You're seeing like, it's a big deal. Most people, when they do our tests, they're more uh, mentally exhausted than they are physically because they're literally just throwing up everything that they have probably learned in the last year or two. So they're exporting it. They're thinking of it. They're doing it. And then at the end, now they got to go fight uh, usually a black belt. And so- we're trying to see kind of what they're doing. And I'm not expecting them to beat me. What I'm expecting them is to, I'm trying to see how they react. Like if I mount you, are you deer in the headlights? Or are you actually trying to get my hands to the ground and trying to elbow escape? If I put you in the guard, are you controlling my posture? Are you just like deer in the headlights? I'm more kind of checking 
for those key pieces. Yeah. Well, and I'm sure being at the end of the class too, it also helps because with them being as tired as they are, if they're able to pull off some of that stuff that you're looking for, you kind of know, man, even exhausted, this person's got it. Maybe fresh, this person has it to a little bit higher proficiency. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, yeah, so we're not looking what much for like, it's not like a grade on that one. It's basically just like a pass or fail. Like, I'm just like, was it good enough to be a blue belt? Like, are you doing majority of the things right? Yeah, but you know, you're going to get better. You're going to get improved. So um, with the Roy Dean thing, you know, we don't really put them through all the different belts. You know, we've talked about that before, but it's just takes a lot of time. I got to recruit people. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, it seems like a cool concept, but yeah, it's, that's, that's uh... a, to be exhausted as you are and then have to go with the black belt at the, at the end level. It's like, man, I, I can't imagine. Usually what our students will say though, is that they feel like that they earned it because they actually did like an hour to hour and a half, like, like they did something to earn it. Not, not that saying that if you got your blue belt because you won a tournament and they promoted you on a podium, you did do something you won. Like you did do that. But a lot of times you're just like, well, did I get it because I won the tournament or, and, and it might be that, like, obviously you had to put in work in the room in other ways, but sometimes students just get belts because they showed up to class one day and they're like, I don't really know why I got it, but I guess it's because I did good. But when you kind of put it into an exam format, it makes students be like, okay, I got it. Yeah. Well, and I've, I've heard of other schools doing it where like they say, you know, each tournament that you win, I'm not saying this is a correct way at all. I'm just saying I've heard of other schools doing it where you win a tournament, you get a stripe, you win a tournament, you get a stripe. Wow. And, and I, that might be a topic for another time, but um, that's, we, we could dive down a rabbit hole on that one. <laughs>